This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including High Tech Oki, Jim Hurt, Logan Larson, and our new patron, Kim. Welcome, Kim. On this episode of DTNS, what would you pay for a Disney Plus and Hulu combo app? Amazon looks to replace Android in its Fire TV line, and Humane's wearable AI device is real, everybody. Gonna talk about it. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, November 9th, 2023. From Studio Secret Bunker, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us today is Tristan Jutra, host of AI Name the Show and also the Momentous Podcast. Prolific podcaster, you've got a friend in us. Tristan, welcome. And too much free time, apparently. <laughs> Until Not you anymore. have too many podcasts, as I've learned, and then you don't have much free time at all. Uh, but we're, we're really glad to have you with us today. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about. And let's kick it off, starting with the quick hits. Privacy-focused app Signal launched a public test today to let users sign up without a phone number through a new beta build available in its community forums. Signal VP of Engineering Jim O'Leary says, After rounds of internal testing, we've hit the point where we think the community that powers these forums can help us test even further before public launch. Activision Blizzard wasn't super bullish on its Overwatch League earlier this year. And Thursday, the company confirmed that the league, the first was announced in 2016, is being sunsetted. The Overwatch League was based on a home and away matches, eventually culminating in a playoff series and world championship. Omegle, the anonymous video chat service that you may not have heard of, but many people use that randomly connected users with strangers, is shutting down after 14 years. Founder Leif K. Brooks said that operating Omegle is no longer sustainable financially or physiologically, and that fighting to prevent it from being misused was simply too much. Omegle's shutdown comes at a time when strict legislation to prevent things like child sexual exploitation is being introduced by lawmakers, and Omegle did not feel that it could uh, properly mitigate those risks. In its latest quarter, Sony reported operating profit fell 29% between July and September due to weaker performance at its image sensor and financial divisions. Profit for the quarter was 263 billion yen or $1.74 billion, which was below estimates. Sony has also cut the number of live service games it plans to release over the next few years in half. Sony originally planned to have 12 live service titles in the market by its fiscal year ending in March of 2026, and that was up from three during its last business year ended this March. Reportedly, amidst the PlayStation exec team saying it partnered with Destiny Studio Bungie for rigorous portfolio review processes, the, some projects have been scaled back. Mm -mm. Things happening at Sony. Things also happening at NASA. NASA launched a free on-demand streaming service inside the recently updated NASA app. NASA Plus, because of course, what else would it be called, is NASA's first on-demand streaming service and available on most uh, major streaming platforms, Android, iOS, Apple TV, Fire TV, which we'll talk about later on the show, Roku, and the web. NASA Plus is focused on news and educational content, including updates on current missions, behind-the-scenes videos, live streams of interesting events, and documentaries and docu-series. All right, Rob, let's talk more about uh, what Disney Plus and Hulu might get us. Well, Disney CEO Bob Iger announced that the company will launch a beta test of a new app next month combining Disney Plus and Hulu in a single experience for subscribers of both services. Disney is still in the midst of closing its deal with Comcast to buy out NBC Universal's 33% stake in Hulu. In a filing last week, the company said it would pay at least $8, or excuse me, 8 $1.61 billion to Comcast to secure its Hulu stake. Can you imagine if it was like just $8, okay? And let's Homeboy call it Shopping Network day. price if it's just $8, yeah, cutting prices yeah. in half. <laughs> uh, Trist Tristan, are you a Disney Plus and or Hulu user? And if so, or if you have either, would you like a combined product? Well, when Disney Plus launched in Canada, um, 
I gave it a I gave it a pass the first year. I did like a free month trial, watched I think season one of The Mandalorian. But at the time, the content on there was mostly kid and family oriented. We don't have any kids here, so we uh, we waited until the next year uh, when Mandalorian season two came out, and then not too long afterward, I think um, we we started to see the schedule coming with all of the Marvel series, and not too long after that, they acquired uh, Disney acquired Fox, so we started to see stuff from FX and star and all, all things coming together. So yes, we, we got in when Disney Plus was cheap. And of course, they keep ratcheting it up every year, like all the st uh, streaming services seem to nowadays. Now here in Canada, we don't actually have Hulu, but mm, some of what mm -hmm. appears on Hulu shows up on uh, another service that's a Canadian service called Crave, which is owned by one of our telecom companies here known as Bell Media. And you can get Crave through um, your a cable provider and it's basically kind of like you get HBO Canada through that and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, I, I, I'm a little confused. Like, so this is going to be for people who subscribe to both Hulu and Disney Plus in the US and they'll get a combined app experience. So if they subscribe to both, they can access Hulu through the Disney Plus app. But if you're Hulu only, you still got to use the, Holy, the, the Hulu app. And if you're Disney Plus only, then you still use the Disney Plus app. But there's still just two apps. There's not going to be three. Is that what I'm understanding? That's how I understand it as well. Well, Rob, I know I know you have some thoughts on Disney Plus and Hulu, uh, both having content that you like. And what what do you think is might be a, a good a good move here by the two companies well, to combine? Com combining these two apps together could I see it as a good move because there's I, I would imagine that there are quite a few people like me. I actually cancel and resubscribe to Disney Plus fairly regularly because there's only certain shows on Disney that I watch. You know, I, I can only watch a Marvel movie so many times. I can only watch a Disney movie so many times. So for me, it's really when new Star Trek content comes out. So I will, you know, when new Star Trek comes, content comes out, I'll get about halfway through the season. Then I will uh, subscribe to it, watch an episode or two a week. And then when that season is done, I cancel and wait another two months for the next Star Trek thing that comes out. This probably would keep me from doing that because I also use Hulu and I watch stuff on Hulu every day. So in my mind, if I'm paying for both and I have a unified uh, you know, app, I probably don't think, oh, I need to go cancel Disney, the Disney part of it. I probably just leave everything running. So if there's more than just a few people who are like me, this would actually make financial sense for Disney to do this. Well, and fi financial sense, hopefully, but also just, hey, one app instead of two. No, you know, that's just that much less time you have thinking about where is that you know show that i want is it hulu is it disney plus um i tristan you mentioned the mandalorian i'm with rob uh and i do this not only on disney plus but it's like the mandalorian is a show i like very much uh when it's over <laughs> i just stop paying uh no not to say that the the uh disney plus uh, um, the, the library isn't robust in many other ways, but yeah, a lot of kids content. It just depends on what you're looking for in a household. You know, are you a single person like me with a dog? Eh, probably not caring about all that much Disney stuff, but sometimes, but I do the same thing. I've done that with HBO for years, uh, yep. Netflix for years, uh, you know, anytime I'm not penalized from saying like, I'm out. And I might come back later. I've done YouTube TV plenty of times, you know, outside sports season. I'm not paying for it. Are they doing an exit interview every time you uh, cancel? <laughs> Thankfully, no. But I mean, if they were to, I'd say it's because yeah. you guys just don't have what I want anymore. Yeah. And I'll be back, yeah. maybe. G G would, Game of Thrones I effect for sure there. <laughs> Yeah. I would add that uh, because of uh, some of the box office performance of some recent Disney movies, um, there is a very real impetus, especially the, the, in the theme parks, uh, not uh, uh, bringing the revenue that they expected. Um, Iger is under the, under the gun to kind of turn things at least in a more positive direction uh, uh, finance-wise for the company. And if you can make the Disney Hulu service more sticky, so as Rob was saying, people aren't ditching it as soon as they're done binge-watching their, their Mandalorian uh, or, or, or Marvel series uh, and then you know waiting the three months and then resubscribing again. If you make it sticky enough, um, you can at least have a, a consistent level uh, of revenue. One of the things that you know Disney was doing was bundling Disney, uh, Hulu, and of course ESPN. And over over the last uh, 
uh, holiday uh, shopping season, they bundled Disney Plus as well as the Hulu, the ad version, uh, which is what I'm paying for right now, five bucks a month, right? And so the idea is to make it super attractive. And instead of splitting your attention between two apps, everything's in front of your face. And so, yeah. hey, I don't need to see, I don't see, need to see uh, The Little Mermaid again for the fifth time. I can go watch, you know, whatever is on Hulu, whether it's an old season of X Files or something new. Um, you know, the, the idea, of course, is to keep, keep and retain, which is the problem right now, is to retain the eyeballs. Well, their losses have been with it was it pre the previous fiscal year they lost ten billion dollars on the on the streaming and now it's it seems it, it's it's a bit less but it's still they're decreasing their losses that's the good news anything they can do to reduce churn would definitely be helpful and to your point Roger if you're keeping both the Hulu and Disney Plus stuff in people's face maybe they'll be encouraged to to keep both yeah I mean if you if if you have both in a single app and you're paying one fee you see it as the one thing right now I see Hulu yeah. and Disney Plus as two separate things because they're two separate apps. Uh, on my device, and so psychologically, it makes a it makes a smarter play for them. I wonder what's going to happen when when the when Disney uh, sorry NBC Universal finally divests, and then it's just Disney holding the bag. Are we going to ha have that NBC Universal content eventually disappear? And will who like will Hulu be less uh, attractive proposition? And I mean that could also well be well, like you got to yeah, fortify I mean, something I, all around. Yeah, th there's something. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the Hulu saga will never end. I mean, maybe it will, but uh, it certainly hasn't since, I don't know, I first heard about it in 2007 when it was a very, very different prospect. Um, you know, this is this is the early days of streaming television, um, and Hulu is now, you know, it's, it's a very, very interesting player in the game, uh, has lots of content uh, associated with Hulu. To put Hulu and Disney Plus together, I think, is 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 very smart um and i mean unless it's 26 dollars a month i don't know maybe it will be but probably not uh i think i think it is in the best interest of people who maybe have streaming service fatigue um to to have more bang for your buck in that one app and as a quick little footnote, I, 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 one of the things I understand is that Disney will be re-architecting things a little bit to, to, for parental controls because once you bring all that Hulu content in there, it's not, not, of it, not all of it's quite so family friendly and, and whatnot. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, a bit to do under the hood. Well, Jenko Rockers, uh, writing for Lopass at lopass.cc, reports his sources say that Amazon is readying a new operating system to replace Android on its Fire TVs and smart displays and other connected devices that use the Fire TV ecosystem. Reportedly known as Vega internally, the new OS has been tested on Fire TV streaming adapters, and Amazon has told select partners it plans to transition to a new application framework soon, although no exact date, or at least not that one that we know about. Now, Rob, you're in the Fire TV ecosystem, so let's talk about what you like about it and what might benefit from a refresh. So I am. I own a couple of Fire TVs. I have a Fire Stick, and I even somewhere around here, there is a Fire Tablet. I could honestly care less what they do with the operating system on the television or on the stick. If they change from Android to something else on the tablet, my opinion, they will sell significantly less than they sell right now, which is all, not all that many. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, you know, like I said, I, I, I simply don't even use that Android tablet because it doesn't feel like Android. So if it's not Android, there's really no reason for me to ever pick that up or to ever, ever purchase that. Now that's just me. There may be people who really love those devices. I know a lot of folks get them for their children because they are so inexpensive and they're and they're fairly rugged. So maybe that that's the play for them. But as a tablet, I just do not like Amazon's version of Android, uh, you know, you know, on those devices. And this would just push me even further away. But what, I mean, if you don't like Android on, uh, you know, it, the Amazon version of, of Fire Android, uh, you know, what, who's to say that the next generation, you know, known as Vega, apparently might not be better? Could be. 
I just wouldn't bet. <laughs> I just, Rob's I like, don't, trust I, me, I just um, don't want I, it. I, I've seen Amazon do these things before, and you know, like you know, it's like I, I don't believe what you say because I see what you've done. It's it's, uh, I I just I don't know that I would trust that. So um, you know, a- Android is a pretty solid operating system. It doesn't feel like Android when you're running it on a Fire tablet. So mm. may, may, maybe the, may, maybe you're right, Sarah. May, maybe the fact that they if they do just completely move away from Android to make it something else. But now, you you know, you, you've got to you now got to compete with these giant behemoths called Android and called iOS. I just I don't know that that's going to work for them. Tristan, what do you think? What do you think about, uh, you know, Amazon's own version of Android? Do you have experience with the Fire TV uh, ecosystem? Well, not so much the Fire TV ecosystem in our household, since we're pretty in the bag for Apple. So we've got Apple TVs all over the place. But when the Fire, the first Fire uh, tablet came out, uh, I think it was it was the, the Kindle, the original Kindle tablet, and it was um, after like they because I'd bought for my wife Stephanie the original Kindle. I came down to the states to get it, and you know, that was one with the keyboard and everything. It was wild. We still have it in a drawer somewhere. But then the first the um, the, the Kindle tablet came out that was basically had a, was running a nerfed version of Android. It was I'm not even sure if they called it Fire OS at the time. I think it was a Kindle Fire tablet. It was a little one, and it was fine. Except it was weird. Like you know, to Rob's point, it's Android, but it's kind of not because you didn't have access to the full Android ecosystem at that point. So so, um, you know, I'm not sure, you, not having had direct experience with what's happening on the Fire Sticks and the Fire TVs, it, but the way I see it, though, is, is this is maybe going to further fragment things. I mean, they, are, they, are they getting not invented here syndrome? Um, there's, you know, what, why not? Hey, hit up Ty, uh, Samsung. Maybe they got a good deal on Tizen right now. <laughs> but I, I, I see, yeah. I, but I, I get it from a strategic point of view, wanting to own Speaking the whole of stack. alternative OSs. Yeah, exactly. Mm. But, you know, just like with the, Apple and Tim Cook saying, oh, we want to we want to own all our key you know components of our, our key technologies and our products. Maybe um, Andy Jassy is thinking the, the same thing when it when it comes to Amazon. Like, why are we relying on a third party operating system that we have to customize when we can build our own for the from the ground? up and maybe it'll let us do more data mining than android lets us i mean i'm i i like to think i'm not an amazon apologist of any kind but if any company needs its own os it's amazon well i mean it's also google and apple and you know it, you know the variety of other companies but it's also amazon I'm frankly shocked uh, that we haven't been talking about this until now. Now, not to say that, you know, all of a sudden Fire TVs are going to be running, you know, Amazon OS or whatever. Um, but it does sound like the company feels that they've probably gotten enough feedback from like what you said, Rob, is like, it's fine, but it's not anything great. You know, it's like a, you know, Amazon forked version of Android that, you know, is is just not going to impress anybody. And Amazon is a company that can that can reimagine this. I I'll be interested to see where it goes. Especially if they do something interesting like um, LG uh, how they adapted webOS. It's it's quite a different interface. I mean, most of what we're seeing on streaming sticks and streaming boxes are just glorified web apps, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, it would be great to see Amazon do something different. And you're right, Sarah. There's that's there been an OS has been conspicuous by its absence, uh, an Amazon native OS. So, maybe maybe they were thinking the operating systems were a thing of the past, since you know everything is web now, and who knows what the next thing is. Everything, I suspect that maybe it's going to be deeper AI integration because they, you know, they've been kind of quiet. I mean, they, they invested in Anthropic recently. Uh, they they were kind of ahead of the gate with Alexa, but, you know, they, their commitment to Alexa has seemed suspect over the last uh, year or so, and they've, yeah. they've recommitted to it, but maybe they're going to double down and this will be like the AI TVs. Well, y'all, uh, if you're ever wondering what Tom Merritt thinks the top five technologies are impacting the world of news reporting, uh, because nobody would know better than Tom Merritt, uh, you're going to want to watch Tom's top five this week. This is the show where Tom breaks down the top five things you need to know about technology. News reporting is uh, top of mind this week. Catch it this Friday, youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Humane has been 
teasing its wearable AI device most of this year with co-founder Imran Shadri demoing the device at a TED Talk back in April. But today, the company has officially launched the AI Pen. The square-shaped AI wearable has been described by The Verge and other outlets as a wearable smartphone without a screen. The Pen is a square device that clips to your clothes or other surface. The magnetic clip piece also doubles as the battery. It's powered by a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor and comes with a built-in camera, depth and motion sensors, Bluetooth, a speaker called a Personic speaker and a green laser projector. The green laser projector is used to project visual information onto your hand. Yeah, so the device doesn't automatically record or listen for wake words, as you might expect a device like this would. It needs to be activated by either tapping and dragging on the touchpad. The pin's trust light also blinks uh, when it's collecting data, so you know when it is listening, so to speak. The AI pin runs on an OS called cosmos are you listening amazon <laughs> that uses an ai framework called uh, ai bus uh, to eliminate the need for users to manage their apps or at least cut down on the need for them to do that humane says that chat gpt access is one of its main features on the pin but its press materials also mention collaboration with microsoft in addition to open ai Interesting. The Verge suggests the idea behind the pin, if you're kind of going like, yeah, do I really want to put something you know, on my lapel? How is this going to help me? Is to remove all of the user interface clutter and have a straight interaction with a large language language model using either voice or simple touch or both an analog to the way that people interface with LLMs and generative AI using text prompts. The price for the AI pin, $699 plus a $24 per month subscription fee, which also gives a phone number and data service through T-Mobile's network. So you get, you get something here, but this is an ongoing cost. Wired reports that pre-orders uh, begin November 16th and will start shipping in early 2024. Tristan, I don't know if you saw... Uh, Humane's initial TED Talk. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, at the time, and we talked about it here on DTNS, at the time we went, seems interesting, also seems vaporware-ish. Like, what is it? We didn't know. That was months ago. So what do you think now? Well, they've been operating under the radar for the better part of what, four or five years now. And I think that's why people were so surprised when the, uh, uh, Imran Chaudhry did his TED Talk back in the spring. It's like, well, where does this come from? Is, and, and hence the vaporware talk. And when we watched, this at the, we watched that at the time, yeah, was a little skeptical, skeptical, some cool ideas. I, I actually kind of dig the projection onto the hand, you know, especially if you are in a situation where you can't grab your phone out of your pocket to do things. Um, that, that's, that's sort of neat. And they actually, what they, uh, one of the things they revealed today that wasn't alluded to in the original TED Talk, I, I believe, was the ability to sort of interact with your hand. So by by tilting your hand one direction or another, you could select some of the options on the screen and mm -hmm. then tap yeah. your fingers together, not unlike what we've seen with the uh, Apple Vision Pro to actually choose um, the item that you've selected. So there's some, uh, obviously some wild inter human interface uh, challenges that they are uh, addressing. One of the things that I was wondering about is like, do you have to, uh, you know, have the voice talking to you, or can you have it like with the speakers, or can you have it in earbuds? Sounds like it's got Bluetooth, so that's uh, less concern. Even though one I've, would uh, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they... apparently they're pretty quiet, pretty directional, um, like we've seen with the, uh, the, the 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 Meta Ray Ban glasses as well. So that all you know, that kind of beam forming and whatnot is it seems to be happening. But I, in a lot of ways, like I'm excited. This is the you know, is this the Star Trek communicator come to life? I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of other thoughts and concerns when we dig into this. But, um, you know, there's, there's potential here. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Rob. I mean, we talk so much on the show of, okay, well, you know, we've all got smartphones or, you know, m m many people who are on the show or listen to the show do. And okay, you know, are smart glasses the future? Is there some sort of AR, you know, uh, you know, pass through situation that you know we haven't thought about that uh, that's you know like the Vision Pro, like you mentioned, Tristan, that's going to be something that is just status quo, or is a company like Humane thinking a little outside the box to the point where you just have something that's attached to you and you can use 
I don't know, a hand or a piece of paper or, you know, all sorts of things that that doesn't require you to fish something out of your pocket or or a handbag of some kind. I so want this to work. Um, mm-hmm. This is a device for me. I don't know the first iteration. I, I think I need to see the second one come out um, when it's been proven to be a good idea. But um, if, if they if they ever make this thing look like a communicator badge from, you know, from Star Trek, I know I'm wearing a Star Wars shirt right now, but I'm just as big a fan of Star Trek, maybe even a little bigger. If they make it look like that, I'm getting one just because. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so right there with you. Yeah. But this this is really cool technology. The, the fact that you have a device that you can wear and it is your computer. I mean, and if, and if they make the voice, if they make it the, you know, the, I, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but the, the lady who actually did the voice for the, you know, for the bridge computer, uh, you know, in TNG. Yeah. yeah. If, 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 if they did that, yeah, I'm, I'm just getting one, but, uh, this is really, really cool technology. And, you know, the, the fact that you could, you know, just, you know, you get a message, you need to see it real quick. You hold your hand, you know, you know, close to your chest and you just read and then, and, and you, then you're done while you're walking down the street. I am really into this technology. I just hope that it actually works and they can bring this to fruition and, you know, it, it's going to get some mass adoption. And anything that you attach to clothing is all going to depend on the clothing that someone wears and, you know, is there any friction involved and this and that. What I, what I equate this to most closely is a smartwatch. I mean, I wear my Apple Watch all day, every day. I mean, unless it needs to be charged, but I even wear it overnight. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm into it. But it's a thing that has to pair with a phone. Um, and I assume that, you know, humans um, uh, model will as well, you know, for a, a certain amount of information. But it's also something that I have to wear. You know, I have to wear in lieu of something else on on my wrist or, you know, instead of nothing at all, which a lot of people prefer. It's great, but it's not perfect. It's a great sort of, you know, tech thing that does a lot for me, but I still don't feel like it's really a standalone product. Well, if it was good enough for all those runway models at Paris Fashion Week, Sarah, you know, we, we should be able to well, yeah, figure I know, it out. You know, who am I? Who am I? <laughs> it, and it, now it seems like Humane has thought through some of the practicalities. One of my concerns out of the gate when I first saw the original uh, d- demo uh, at the TED Talk was like, well, if, is this a clip? Is this a pocket? What if you don't have, wear a shirt with a pocket? I wear turtlenecks in the mm-hmm, winter. How's that mm-hmm. going to work? But they do have a wide variety of accessories, some are included, some are added. So they're coming out of the gate with a whole e- accessory ecosystem, you know, a la GoPro and, and others where that's where the margins are, right? So you, for your $699 US, you get the AI pin, you get a cable and adapter, you get uh, a you know, charge pod, you get an extra battery booster. And so you put the, the front goes on the front of the, the front of the device goes on the front of your uh, shirt. The, the battery booster goes on the back and it, it, there's, so it's magnetic, sticks together nicely. There is a tiny built-in battery so it doesn't lose its state while you're swapping the batteries out. And they didn't mention in the uh, the launch video with the two co-founders, Imran Chowdhury and Bethany Biongiorno, who are both uh, Apple uh, alumni. And, and uh, there's other Apple alumni working with them as well. Be like Ken Casienda, uh, who worked uh, quite heavily on the uh, Apple keyboard. So these are user interface uh, experts thoughtful design type people. You, you get a charge case which, with it, which looks like a futuristic AirPods charging case. It's like, you know, it looks like shiny metal. Um, so they have thought some of the, the wearable aspects through. There's also an optional clip for uh, to attach to different types of clothing or handbags. It's rotatable. There's a latch for thinner, delicate uh, clothing for or for workout wear. And there's different shields to customize the fronts. So you could do different colors on there. So Rob, you could designate your, uh, your rank you're in Starfleet uh, perhaps it was by your choice of color. <laughs> but the price, I think the price up front, sure. I it's, know. You know, first generation. I know. Yeah. We kind of but glossed over that somewhere. through this yeah. entire conversation. The price is, it's high. And listen, have, you know, yeah. early adopters, you know, they're going to adopt. Um, I, you know, the, it, the price gives me pause. Uh, I want someone to 
try it out and then tell me that I need yeah. it. Uh, quite frankly, the upfront pr- price concerns me less than the $24 per month each and every month for a separate cell phone plan with, with T-Mobile. I mean, I get that this is not attached to your phone. So it's you can't do like an add-on 5 or $10 a month plan like you can do with iPads or Apple Watches through some carriers. But that's a heavy lift if you're already paying for uh, a cell phone plan. But, you know, it's unlimited talk, text, and data. It's got cloud storage. So it's more than just the cell access through T-Mobile. Uh, no details for Canada yet. But uh, if it was if it was ten dollars a month, maybe even fifteen, that would be a little easier to swallow. But an extra, you know, almost twenty five bucks a month, uh, I don't know about that. It also this is something that I went through with my Apple Watch again, apples and oranges. But at first, I I did pay for a cell plan uh, because I thought you know let let let's see how often I need it. The answer was kind of never because it's just so rare that I don't have my phone with me to pair yep. to. You know, it's just some people are like, oh, I'd love to not take my phone on, you know, my next jog, you know, out the front door. I just have it with me. You know, I want to take photos. And, you know, there's so many, so many reasons to do that. So I, I'll, I'll love to see uh, how many people find a subscription like this worth the money. Um, and Tristan, uh, we're counting on you. So you let us know how it goes. <laughs> well, they, I mean, um, if, 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 I'm sure we got to wrap it up. We've got lots more thoughts on this. And Tasia and I will be digging into it on AI Name the Show next week as well. But I mean, are we, is this take, take us into an AI fueled dystopia where we've got these things on us all the time with their, even with their safety lights? Oh, I think, I think we're already in that dystopia. Uh, <laughs> it just, it, you know, let's just talk about how far it goes. Um, but Tristan, you did mention AI named the show um, that you uh, and, and Tasia Custody uh, host together. And I know you've got other stuff going on. So let folks know where they can keep up with your work. So you can follow AI uh, us at AI Name This Show dot com. We have new episodes drop uh, every Friday midday Pacific time. And Tasia and I also co-host uh, another show called Momentous Live. That usually we that live streams on Tuesdays, and then the podcast version comes out a couple of days later, and we get get around to it. And that's just like general tech. It's like it's like a it's like a low rent version of this, but just once a week. And oh, that's at Momentous well, TV. <laughs> don't sell yourself short. Come on. You know, AI named it after all. Well, we're so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I hope to have you again soon. Uh, Just a reminder to patrons, stick around because we have an extended show, Good Day Internet, where we talk about more stuff. Today, we're going to talk about what Microsoft wants you to know, or at least wants to know about you when you ditch OneDrive, if you do. But just a reminder, our show is live. DTNS is live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are off tomorrow for the Veterans Day holiday in the U.S., but we will be back on Monday with Allison Sheridan joining us. Don't miss it. Have a wonderful holiday, everybody. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Dutterdine. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Cap Kipper, Steve Guadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, aka Gadget Virtuoso, and JD Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Chris Ashley and Scott Johnson. And guests on this week's show included Tristan Jutras. Thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>